In this video, we talk about birth control. What a father must know about birth control. So we talk about where it all started, just a little history, very brief, what contraceptive responsibility entails, and then why unplanned pregnancies happen, and then uh, birth control methods and the side effects. So I have a very comprehensive list and just kind of go through each and every one of them. And then the protection of life. When are you crossing the line into murder? And then some action items. All right, so where it all started. Birth control has been part of human existence ever since we wanted to be in control, right? Ever since we forgot about God's providence and wise guidance, and we, you know, started thinking we know better. It's been there, you know, there's a story of Onan who didn't want to make his brother's wife pregnant. It's in Genesis 38, 8 to 1, right? Genesis, Genesis 38, 8 to 10, right here. Then Judah said to Er's brother, Onan, go and marry Tamar as our Lord requires. The brother of a man who has died, you must produce an heir for your brother. But Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen on the ground. This prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother. But the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child for his brothers to his dead brother. So the Lord took Onan's life. Yikes. One of the oddest incidences where you find that method. And then the Greeks, you know, like Aristotle, right? He talked about the use of cedar oil of frankincense as spermicides. The natural historian Pliny talked about abstinence, just abstain from sex to not have kids. Casanova in the 1700s, right? He was known to use lemon rinds as a cervical cup. That's, you know, way back then, way back in the day, you know. But no talk of birth control, at least modern day birth control is complete without mentioning the lady named Margaret Sanger. This lady here, she's the founder of the international birth control movement that's now called Planned Parenthood. And it's this movement that actually led to the term birth control. Very polarizing figure. Margaret Sanger. You know, some people look at her like God, pretty much. And then others think she's Hitler. You know what I mean? And you really have to look into it yourself, you know, to make that decision. And uh, I just kind of go on just briefly about her accomplishment in this birth control movement. She has been known to say some very outlandish stuff. She's said some things that nobody can say today in this very politically correct w world. She said some pretty crazy shit. She viewed the rapid population growth at the time as a problem. And she thought it was a problem that required voluntary family limitations for all. She thought overpopulation was the cause of all wars. And if you wanna fix the wars, you might wanna fix the population problem. She was atheist and she was part of a cult called Unity that thought you could heal, you know, the problems of the flesh with being part of this cult. You know, which is kind of like, you know, a very atheist. It's kind of like saying, not God, but we can do it ourselves. And then she also opposed the institution of marriage, claiming that it was designed to keep women oppressed. Anyway, she was very active trying to, you know, promote women's right to have control over their bodies, including birth control. And she ended up being appointed the chairman of the Birth Control League. At the time, it was called, later named Planned, Planned Parenthood. She emphasized the change of name because she was trying to distance herself from the Nazi movement. You know, the Nazis were completely for population control. But, you know, for this movement to have traction in an high Nazi population like the US, she thought it would be a very good idea to take the words birth control out of the name of this organization. Hence, they named it Planned Parenthood. You know, it slides way better off the tongue and it's way more acceptable to a larger population of people. But honestly speaking, their movement was not different from the Nazis. 
you know like if you start looking through some of her writings it's very clear what she was trying to do improving races through the control through the control of her hereditary factors she thought birth control was key to limit what she or who she considered defective while protecting superior breed you know it became a race thing here and she you know more children for the fit and less for the unfit it's like you know who are you to to choose or to pick who's fit and unfit you know what i mean you know saying things like the most merciful thing that the large family does to one of its infants to one of its infant members is to kill it right that's pretty crazy if you ask me you know and she was a very vocal proponent of sterilization she called it a harmless way the moron and the diseased could have no posterity to inherit their unhappy condition she published a magazine called the woman rebel she published this magazine to help spread information about birth control because of the, at the time it was legal but spreading information about it was not right this was called i think the comstock law and she actually ended up going to prison for i think six months the first time was after she opened a birth control clinic she actually had to go to prison for it another interesting lady in this saga is uh, named Catherine McCormick she was the first lady to graduate from MIT with a degree in science and then she got married to a very wealthy dude he ended up being diagnosed with schizophrenia and after she found that out she swore never to have kids ever you know and she was a very big proponent of birth control when her husband died Catherine McCormick she she had quite a little bit of money to her name and at the same time she met up with uh, Margaret Sanger who at the time was trying to find funding for the birth control pill, like the pill that's today known as the pill, right? They met in 1917 for the first time and she just, she was part of this movement because she wanted more effective methods of birth control. So they were struggling for money, right? They didn't have money to fund the research on the birth control pill. So in 1947, after it was shut down, Catherine McCormick was able to donate a huge chunk of money she donated about forty thousand dollars to pretty much margaret sanger you know who put all that money in developing a birth control pill and lo and behold you know it was successful they found out they did the trials you know the details of what happened and the effects you know it's beyond the scope of this video you can look into it you can google and see exactly what happened but just like any you know when you're doing trials you, you're gonna hurt people or people are gonna get hurt but anyway they successfully got the pill so that was the birth of one of the most effective birth control pills there's ever birth control methods that has ever been out there you know at the time so that's just like a very brief history and you know there's a very good book called bad choices by douglas scott this book here it's it's a very good book and it it's not a very biased book it, it kind of looks at everything about this lady's life the bad and the good a lot of her biographies are kind of skewed to make her look like this angel or this nice person but this is a good one if you read this one you kind of see all sides you know she started out as a very very you know life-loving person and then she ended up just kind of losing her way and trying to murder babies you know trying to create a genocide and she's pretty much successful if you look at what's going on because her thing is still like her movement is still alive and well even if she's been dead a long time ago now but anyway that's a very good book it goes into detail on you know pretty much all this stuff that i'm talking about pick it up check it out so next contraceptive responsibility so yeah it's crazy that you know women are not always fertile you know like they're not all there's, there's periods when women are not going to have a baby no matter what right but then with guys we are constantly producing sperm and we're gonna have a kid pretty much every time we ejaculate you know what i'm saying so it's kind of crazy that we focus a lot on the women's side of contraception and i get it you know like they have to bear the burden 
of carrying the child and pretty much being out of commission for i don't know a whole year plus you know taking care of the baby after that so i get why it's more skewed but even there's gotta be more a contraception options or at least there's gotta be research into some contraception methods for dudes you know as far as i know it's condoms and vasectomies period right for dudes but then if you look at the list which i'm gonna go through it's mostly women's birth control and it's not really a free ride for any of them really and then also you know, being a dude at least in my experience we don't get much education on contraception the sex education you say you get in like high school or whenever you start getting sexually active it's, it just doesn't suffice and it, of course you know you're gonna go out and start experimenting and you find out the hard way you know for a lot of people and then for women like you just say 13 year old just slap them on the pill or some other form of birth control and they don't even know the side effects they don't really know what they're getting themselves into and they kind of get lost in it you know what i mean so there isn't that much education on contraception you know hence neither side like when you by the time you're getting sexually active you you don't really know what you're getting yourself into even if you choose a form of contraception you know what i mean why unplanned pregnancies happen many many you know there's many reasons for this but most common is just you're not on any type of contraception method you're not taking any type of contraceptive and you just kind of get carried away in the moment very common i've been through it you know i'm pretty sure that there's a whole bunch of people who've been through it and it's very common you know like those urges are like not really in control at that point you know you kind of are but you're not really like you, the force to reproduce is one that's insane like and the incentives are crazy you know like just how amazing sex is it's like you you're gonna fall in that trap more especially if you're younger and you know you don't know what the hell you're doing and then a lot of it, there's a lot of ignorance to birth control too you know not just the layman but doctors it's kind of like nutrition doctors they don't get taught much about nutrition just because it's just not part of their education or birth control they don't know much right so their methods are more of like the pill solution take this pill and you're good they are taught to prescribe medication that's the bulk of their education so most of what they're going to teach is more of like the instant fix what's something that's going to fix this thing right now and that makes it makes you even say like you you say you have a daughter it just makes them miss out on the larger picture you know what it actually means to learn about your fertility and how to help control conception because it's you know birth control is more of like you're going to take care of it regardless of what happens that's more of birth control but the goal should be to just prevent conception you know you just don't want to have the baby in the first place you know what i'm saying another thing is that say doctors don't have the incentive to promote methods that don't make them money you know if they don't have no time to start teaching you some natural birth control methods that they're not going to make any money from because what it is with birth control is they either put you on set a pill where you have to get it from them they prescribe it to you right or some form of device that they'll have to do some form of surgery and you got to go back to them for checkups and stuff like that but if they just promote this thing that's like natural and it takes some work and you know it takes them out of the picture they're not going to teach you that that they're trying to make money and we should never forget that a lot of these hospitals are just some money making machines and that's their end goal is to make some money so if the method is not going to make them some cash they're most likely not going to prescribe it to you also just workload right they, they have so much to do they have so many patients to see and not that much time some of these methods require hours and hours of training and they only have like what like it's like a more 15 minutes that doctors spend with their patients so it's all that you know and then there's also a whole bunch of myths things like you know ovulation occurs every 14th day you know like sperm leaves a certain amount of maybe sperm leaves 3 days when it can live up to 5 days there's so many of these sound bites and that's what happens with a lot of these doctors advise by the time it gets out it's like this sound bite which 
it doesn't really even mean anything, you know? It, it turns out to be, you know, ovulation occurs every 14 days, when in reality, it occurs whenever the hell it wants to occur. And you need to be able to tell, there's ways you can tell when that's occurring. And I share some resources for that at the end of this video. And then also some people just don't wanna pick from any one of them because again, it's not a free ride for any of them, right? A lot of dudes don't wanna get vasectomies because Again, reversing it is tough. There's that, f I've gone through it. I've thought about it, but it's just that feeling of you castrating yourself is what you're doing. And you never know in the future, more especially if you don't have any more, any kids, you never know, you might wanna have kids and reversing this is not as easy as they make it seem. You know, more especially if you have one of them shady ass doctors, you gotta have a very good one. And even then, you know, it's you, you're rolling the dice. It's not like it's guaranteed that you can reverse it once you do it. And then for these methods that are all pretty much artificial hormones that you secreting in your body, you know, for the for the ladies, it's not a free ride. They come with all kinds of side effects, which we'll go through and check every single one of them. And then even if you're taking birth control, none of them are 100%, right? None of them. There's always going to be that percentage of, you know, chance. It might be 98, that 2%. It might be 99, that 1%. You know, if it happens to you, then it's not even a statistic at all because it, it went down. You know what I mean? It means it didn't, it wasn't effective for you at least and it, it's it happens you know birth control doesn't mean just because you're taking it then it works and then when whenever this birth control fails it's like you know doctors take themselves out of the bay you maybe you didn't do it right you know blaming the victim right there's a, there's this article here contraceptive failure in the united states right estimates from the 2000 from two from the 2006 to 2010 national survey of family growth results so long-acting reversible contraceptive, the IUD and the implant had the lowest failure rates of all methods at 1%, while condoms and withdrawal carried the highest probabilities of failure with 13% and 20% respectively. The failure rate for all reversible methods combined declined from 12% in 2002 to 10% in 2006 to 2010. There's always going to be a chance of an unplanned pregnancy. All right, birth control methods and side effects. So, I mean, I don't know about you. I had to put this list out here because so my wife got this book that had all these different resources. And then I've never seen the whole comprehensive list until I opened that thing. And the first one is the pill, as we talked about, you know, from Margaret Sanger and Catherine McCormick. That was a gift to all the ladies that are trying to make sure they don't get pregnant, right? So the pill, what is it? So the birth control pill also called, the birth control also called the pill is a daily pill that contains hormones to change the way the body works and prevent pregnancy. Very, very straightforward, maybe oversimplified definition there. So availability, prescription needed. So you need to have a doctor to get this. Effectiveness, 91% effective with typical use. And then you got effort, you're taking this thing every day. You have to take it every single day all right benefits and side effects so weight you know unlikely to be affected menstrual changes may become regular lighter and shorter also possible spotting breast tenderness nausea or changes in mood all right so that's the pill and then there's what's called tubal ligation tubal ligation also known as having your tubes tied or tubal sterilization is a surgical procedure that permanently prevents pregnancy by blocking clipping or removing the fallopian tube this is just like i'm done and i'm cutting it right so effectiveness availability so it blocks the fallopian tubes preventing stem from entering the egg effectiveness 99 percent with typical use right there's a chance of infection you might get an infection at the wound you might experience side effects from general anesthesia yes yeah, so this is it's pretty much surgery so they're putting you out so whatever it's very invasive too so whatever side effect that surgery has this should be you know one of them next implanon right so implanon is a small flexible plastic rod that's inserted under the skin of the upper arm to prevent pregnancy it's also known by its brand names nextplanon and 
circlet. What are the side effects? So the most common side effects is irregular bleeding, aka spotting, especially in the first six to 12 months. But most people on the implant get lighter periods or their periods stop altogether. All right, etanogestrel is similar to a natural hormone made in your body. This product does not contain any estrogen. What are the side effects? Menstrual changes, spotting, pain, mood swings, nervous or depression, headaches, breast pain, acne, weight gain, dizziness, hair loss, vagina irritation or discharge. Okay. All right. So that was Implanon. Next, Depo-Provera injection. So Depo-Provera, also known as the birth control shot or DMPA, is a contraceptive injection that contains the hormone progestin. It's injected every 11 to 13 weeks, either intramuscularly into a muscle or subcutaneously beneath the skin. Depo-Provera works by preventing ovulation and thickening cervical mucus to keep sperm from reaching an egg. When used perfectly, it's 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. But for typical users, it's 96% effective. All right, so this is just like a shot. Every 11 to 13 weeks, <laughs> side effects. Irregular menstrual periods, headaches, nervousness, depression, acne, changes in appetite, weight gain, excessive growth of, of facial and body hair. All right, Nuvering. Come on. So the vaginal contraceptive ring is a small flexible plastic rod that is placed into the vagina to prevent pregnancy. Okay, this is not... You know, but again, it's hormones. Common side effects include headaches, nausea, sore breasts, changes in periods, spotting, more vaginal wetness, vaginal discomfort or irritation, vomiting, bloating, swelling of the ankles or feet. Next, the patch. Again, this is just a patch. It you know, so the patch is a thin beige piece of plastic that looks like a square bandage. It's easy to use and works like the pill, but you only need to change your patch once a week. 91% effective, all right? But you stick it on your skin. Nausea, skin irritation, chest pain, weight gain, irregular bleeding, headaches, breast and moods. Could this be why a lot of ladies are getting a little fat? I don't know. Anyway, listen, so there's the diaphragm and there's condoms, which are both male and female. Ain't nobody using the female condom. Let's just get that out of Ooh, If you use that, leave a comment in the description. There's the cervical cup, there's the sponge, suppositories, spermicides, films, forms, and jellies. And then, then there's the intertorine device. This is a little different. The I, IUD. An intertorine device is a small T-shaped piece of plastic that is inserted into the uterus to prevent pregnancy. IUDs are a type of long-acting reversible contraception that can be effective for three to 10 years, depending on the type they are one of the most effective forms of contraception available with failure rates similar to sterilization. Side effects, right? Periods like pain a few days after insertion, thrusts that keep coming back, moderate to severe abdominal pain or pressure, nausea, vomiting, lightheadedness, dizziness, fainting. Again, there is side effects. It's not a free ride, you know? Painful sex, Ooh, sepsis, allergic reaction. All right, so that's that one. That one stands out. That's intertorine device, IUD. Anyway, this, that's a whole list here, right? And then, of course, there's always natural methods, but they're just not popular because it's uh, it takes effort and work, and it's not just, you know, a quick, fix you need to got kind of get to know yourself and have some discipline in the beginning but it's there you know and once you learn how to use it it's pretty effective but a lot of people shy away from things that require work hence if this whole list fails right you try the pill you try all this and i just talked about it's not a free ride you you're dealing with all these kind of side effects there's also a possibility that even after you own this stuff you can still be pregnant which is like yeah a lot of people talk about natural birth control as hell you, you know it never works yeah same as the other ones and with the other ones there's it comes with some baggage there's all these side effects that are pretty you know i wouldn't want the people that i love to go through all those things just because what like they're trying to prevent having a baby you can prevent having a baby and not go through all that extra shit and then when all else fails and you still get pregnant there's the most effective method abortion right just kill it all right the protection of life. In his book, Politics According to the Bible, right? Wayne Good or Wayne Grudem. This book here, very, very good book. 
check it out he asks some pretty tough questions on on the issue of abortion you know should government make laws to protect pre-born children and as it stands right now the answer is no right the government is not your life is protected you if you're walking down the street and somebody kills you or hell if your mom gets a rod and hits you across the head while you were making a sandwich in the kitchen she's going to jail but if she's the one carrying the baby in her stomach she can kill it all the way up to it's 24 to 28 weeks right and it's fine right so that's been the case after the ruling of the case the famous case of Roe v Wade you know children don't get any protection Roe v Wade was a landmark 1973 decision that ruled abortion as a constitutional right in this case the Supreme Court ruled that a woman's choice to have an abortion outweighs the state's concern for prenatal life up until the point of fetal viability or the point when a fetus can survive outside the womb in 1973 this was determined to be 24 to 28 weeks since this decision abortion has been a federally protected right regardless of state laws so you know it's been overturned but still there's states that are still holding on to it but it's a big deal you know and this this map here it shows in pink the ban or most likely to ban right and then in purple it's legal with no restriction so here boom 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 right oregon colorado new mexico alaska virginia new jersey new hampshire it's like you know just let it rip pretty much and then legal with restrictions are the ones with stripes you know so it's kind of like this gray area for a lot of places but then there's, a, there's still places where it's like you can do whatever you want right and yeah. roe v wade was named for jane roe an alias for a texas resident named noma mccovey and henry wade who was the district attorney for dallas county texas pretty crazy because this lady ended up actually having this her kid right because it took i forget how long it took but it took so long for this case to be done and by the time it was done she had the baby and she ended up putting her kid on adoption and she's still out there i saw her in the atlantic living good life so let's say the answer was yes right we should protect pre-born children then should the child be protected at the moment of conception like the moment there's life or at a later point in the pregnancy again you know roe v wade says 24 to 28 weeks you can kill but if we roll back you know if we go back when there was there wasn't all that much noise right if we go back to the time of moses like during the mosaic covenant in exodus it, it contradicts this belief of being okay to murder babies right exodus 21 22 to 22 to 25 here now suppose two men are fighting and in the process they accidentally strike a pregnant woman so she gives she gives birth prematurely if no further injury results the man who struck the woman must pay the amount of compensation the woman's husband demands and the judges approve but if there is further injury the punishment must match the injury a life for a life an eye for an eye a tooth for a tooth a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, and a wound for a, a wound, and a bruise for a bruise. So, you know, if doing it accidentally, you kill somebody, because this was like, they were probably wild dudes back in the day. They're fighting all over the place. And then by accident, they hurt some pregnant lady who hurts the baby and the baby dies. Yeah, that guy's getting killed. And that's by accident. Now, people are doing it intentionally. Um, there's got to be a special place in hell for anybody that intentionally kills a baby period you know the bible is saying we should give protection to the pre-born legal protection to the pre-born child at least equal to that of others in society right so i don't know make some laws it doesn't have to be as the old school as that but there's got to be a penalty for it and then there's an the issue of naming right what should the pre-born child be called you know a fetus a pre-born child an unborn baby a baby as in when your friend finds out at the hospital that they're pregnant you know we're having a baby should you call it? and naming is a big deal it might sound it might look like i'm just you know being over the top here but like what you name the thing uh impacts how you look at it you know if it's a fetus hey we can kill fetuses all day what the hell is that you know embryo it's a child it's a child that you're carrying in there you know and we see 
the same thing in the book of Luke in the New Testament. Luke chapter 1, verses 41 to 44. Mary visits her relative, Elizabeth. Right? Elizabeth was pregnant with John the Baptist at the time. And she makes a comment about how the child, the baby in her belly, lips in joy when she heard Mary come in. Right? She was six months pregnant at the time. Luke at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leaped within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy, right? The baby in my womb. What you name it kind of makes you act different toward it. It was the same thing with uh, Rebecca, the wife of Isaac. She was pregnant with twins, Esau and Jacob at the time. And we read in Genesis 25, 22 to 23. But the two children struggled with each other in the womb, right? The two children. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me? She asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. And your older son will serve your younger son. So again, you know, it's a baby that's in the womb. It's not a fetus. It's not a pre-born thing. Or it's a baby. Once there's life in there, you have a child. You're carrying a child. So the Bible here is showing that we should think of the pre-born child as a person from the moment of conception. Again, you know, another big question is, should the government be paying for abortions? You know, like the efforts at Planned Parenthood. Should government policies be encouraging abortions? Should government po policies be promoting or discouraging the issue of abortion? Most government officials, even the ones that are pro-life, they curve. When it comes to the situation of rape, or incest, right? And birth defects as well. Listen, man, there is no moral justification for killing a child, period. So if you would not think of murdering this child after it was born, then it cannot be right to murder the child before it's born. So that what, you can save yourself some hardship or, or embarrassment? This is, you know, original sin, control. We want to be in control so much. We want to make sure, but we're not, you know, we think we are. And we're not. And there's a lot of situations where the doctor is wrong in the situation of birth defect. You know, doctors screw up all the time. That's known, right? Like medical malpractice is probably like number three on the top list of causes of death. As Christians, you know, these are the times when you want to trust God's providence and wise direction. Exodus 4:11. Then the Lord asks Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? When Jesus saw the man who was blind from birth, as we see in, in John 9, 2, verse 3, chapter 9, verses 2 to 3, Rabbi, his disciple asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him, right? We, we're not in control. We think we're in control and we want to tweak things when really we're not. You know, we don't know when the next breath is not going to go in. But then we have all these plans of what we think we should be doing. So again, as a Christian, trusting in God and listening and seeking his advice before listening to these worldly people that don't even know what they're doing, right? They don't, it's just a movement. And we most people don't even know where this movement came from, but they're just jumping on board, wanting to kill babies because, I don't know, they think, that's the right thing to do. And in the case of rape or incest, again, it's never the fault of the child. He should not be put to death because of someone else's crime. In Deuteronomy 24, 16, it says, parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children, nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. Same thing in Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, 20. The person who sins is the one who will die. The child will not be punished for the parent's sins, and the parent will not be punished for the child's sins. Righteous people will be rewarded for their own righteous behavior, and wicked people will be punished for their own wickedness. These are very rare cases too. You know, issues of rape and incest, of course, they, it does exist. It doesn't give you the right to kill or murder. There's no moral justification for that. 
they do happen but according to some of the most comprehensive research studies on the causes of abortion these are like the tiniest amount right yeah this one why do women have abortions this was ida torres and jacqueline de rouge forest this is one of the most comprehensive ones and in this chart here this one let me see if i can zoom it in Boom, right? Table one, percentage of abortion patients. And I'll link all these in the description if you want to just kind of go through them and look at them for yourself. But anyway, table one, percentage of abortion patients reporting that a specific reason contributed to their decision to have an abortion by age and percentage saying that each reason was the most important. So this is the total, right? From the 1900 participants in this study. And then that's the most important over here. So boom, boom, upon which age breaks down, less than. All right, so again here, women who's victim of rape or incest, it's across the board. It's like 1%, like one percentage point across the board. And then it also even goes down to less than that, right? And then the top one is women concerned about how having a baby could change her life. Again, very selfish. If we're just being objective, it's like, yeah, you screwed up, right? Use this as a chance to learn and grow from the situation because, you know, just because, matter of fact, killing or getting rid of the baby, it's kind of like getting away with, say, stealing, right? When you screw up, it's better to learn by facing the problem. If you run away from it, in most cases, you're just making it worse. So that's the biggest one, concerned about changing life. And then the list one is cases of rape incest. And I, I, you can go, you can say, you know, these are embarrassing cases. A lot of people don't want to talk about st stuff like this, let alone in studies, you know, in research studies. But still, you know, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't mean if that's what happened, then you got to kill the baby. You're not running away from that one. The only time it makes sense to take a life is when you have the choice of losing two lives or at least saving the one out of those two. There, you know, it's morally justifiable, right? If the baby stays in there, the mom is going to die or something like that. Meaning, if and if she dies, then the child dies too. So at least let's save the mom. In a situation like that, I think a doctor is morally justified to do what he's got to do in that situation. And again, these are very rare, uh, rare cases. These are very, you know, few and far between, but they do happen. But the problem is that this is now being abused, right? The pro-abortion people have lumped together together life and health right it's they're redefining terms here so will they die it's very binary will you live or will you die but health has been defined so broadly including things like mental health you know financial stability freedom excessive distress you know, you know things like that so now when you hear the term to save the life or health of the mother, because it's, it's just supposed to be to save the life of the mother, we can get rid of the baby. But now it's like to save the life or the health of the mother. What this means is abortion is allowed pretty much whenever the mom makes up a reason for wanting to have an abortion. In Doe vs. Bottom, a companion case for Roe v. Wade, they were heard on the same day. January 22nd, 1973, maternal health is defined so broadly. It doesn't even make sense how this, you know, is defined. So here it says, we agree with District Court 319 that the medical judgment may be exercised in the light of all factors, physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age relevant to the well-being of the patient. All these factors may relate to health. This allows the attending physician the room he needs to make his best medical judgment. And it is room that operates for the benefit, not for the disadvantage of the pregnant woman. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's open season pretty much. This is so vague and so open-ended, you know what I mean? Almost any reason can be used to have an abortion in the second, even the third trimester of pregnancy. This is good old love for death. Good old human sacrifice is what it is. Whether the person that's doing it is aware of it or not, it's been going on for a very long time. You know, this is not a new thing. It's the ultimate exercise of power, right? Taking somebody's life, wanting to be able to take somebody's life without any consequences. This is what's going on here. And the Old Testament has warned nations that have allowed such stuff to happen. And they've, a lot of them have paid for doing things like this, right? To putting children to death. 
So some Israelites had started mimicking some pagan nations, putting live children in fires to sacrifice them to, you know, pagan gods, Baal, Molech, and the whole host of different gods. And God issues a very stern warning through Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 7, 30 to 34, where is that? 30 to 34, to the whole end, this junk here. The people of Judah have sinned before my very eyes, says the Lord. They have set up their abominable idols right in the temple that bears my name, defiling it. They have built pagan shrines at Topeth and garbage dump in the valley of Beninon, of Ben Hinnom. And there they burn their sons and daughters in the fire. I have never commanded such a horrible deed. It never even crossed my mind to command such a thing. So beware for the time is coming says the Lord, when the garbage dump will no longer be called Topeth or the valley of Ben Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter. They will bury the bodies in top until there is no more room for them. The bodies of my people will be food for the vultures and wild animals, and no one will be left to scare them away. I will put an end to the happy singing and laughter in the streets of Jerusalem. The joyful voices of bridegrooms and brides will no longer be heard in the towns of Judah. The land will lie, will lie in complete desolation, right? And it happened. We feel like we're in control. We feel like we can change things and make things our way. And I mean, I'm not saying it's easy to say have like a, a child with some form of disability or, you know, raising a kid born out of incest. It's, it's a tough one. I'm not taking that out of it. But again, it does not justify the fact that you're killing a baby, right? And it, just think about that. You know, when you're thinking of birth control, think about the whole picture because now we, we try to just, you know, take the quick route, quick, quick fix. And in most cases, it's like a self-gratifying type thing. You know, you want to put yourself first. And I get it. But it does not justify killing babies. And uh, again, it does not justify putting 13 year olds on hormones that change their brain chemistry. You know, just be a little bit more wise about it and kind of know what you're getting yourself into and also teach your kids about it. So yeah, some action items, right? Some action items for this video, pretty easy. This is a good book. It's called Taking Charge of Your Fertility. Yep. Yeah, this book here, Taking Charge of Your Fertility, it's very comprehensive. It shows you step by step how you can learn to avoid pregnancy without the use of uh, hormones or all these crazy things, surgery, you know, and how you can implement this before you go for the drastic measures, right? This is like, it's supposed to be in school. This we're supposed to be learning from, this is like the real sex education. But yeah, this book, check it out. You know, it just opens you up to the possibilities and that you're not doomed to, you know, the current paradigm. You can choose to be different and choose to try to do things a little bit different. And then also read that book, Bad Choices, you know, about Plant Parenthood and what they're all about. Check it out. See why you shouldn't just fall for the one-liners and the sound bites that they put out there. And then there's another book. It's called Beyond the Pale. Yeah, this book here. Yeah, this book is very good. She's a doctor. She was on the pill for 10 years and she's actually a fan of it, but she's not a fan of the things that come with it. And this is a very comprehensive book on what it actually does to you. And most of those methods are all emitting some form of artificial hormone that it changes you. You're not the same person when you're on the pill or on one of those type of birth control methods. And she goes in detail showing how you can, you know, reclaim your body, as it says on there. Because, you know, people gaining weight from this stuff, you know, you wonder why you're exercising and you're doing all these things. You know, telling your wife to lose weight, but then she's on these things and it's causing so much harm. And she shows some good alternatives as well, or a better way to approach it if you want to take this types of birth control methods. Very, very good book. She's smart and she's been on it. She was on the pill, she says, for 10 years, but then she's not a fan of it as much as she used to be. And then lastly, join the Grateful Fatherhood group. It's uncensored and you get, you know, you get to know whenever I post videos like this first. With that being said, thank you very much for spending your time with me and I'll see you in the next one.